Thank you. Sorry, I dropped my cap here. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I was debating preparing some words of thanks, and then I'm like, no, 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 I'll just wing it. But now I'm emotional. Um, just before we get into the word, if I could, um, yeah, just on behalf of my wife, Joanna, and I, just say thank you um, to this church family for, again, it's not just six years on staff, it's 28 years of my life. Um, I grew up here, and many of you literally, well, not literally raised me, I guess figuratively. You guys played a part in me, you know, growing up. And so um, it honestly means the world. And just having an opportunity to serve at my home church as a pastor um, has been awesome. Pastor Danny, thank you um, for every opportunity you've given me, even to to trust me up here. Um, It honestly means the world. I do not take the honor lightly. Um, yeah, it's bittersweet. I'm excited. We're excited. We believe God is calling us to do this, but it is bittersweet as we say goodbye um, as I step off uh, staff here as a pastor. But I believe that God is faithful, and he has some amazing things in store for this church. Amen? Amen. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. <clears throat> All right. Let's get into the word. You guys ready? All right. Let's do it. Okay. So, we are currently in uh, a series, uh, as Pastor Danny just said, called I Am, where we're looking at the seven I Am statements of Jesus in the book of John. And so, uh, I just want to recap really quickly. Um, Back in the Old Testament, there's the story of Moses um, and, and God in the burning bush. Okay, God appears to Moses in a bush that's on fire, but it's not consumed. Um, And Moses kind of has this moment with God where God commands Moses to go to Egypt to um, demand that Pharaoh release the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. And so that's the, you know, the command that he gets. And Moses kind of asks this question. He's like, okay, I'll go. But like, they're going to ask who sent me. And so Moses is like, who do you want me to to say has, has sent me? And God in the bush just says, tell them that I am has sent you. And so it's this crazy moment where God displays his glory, right? He says, he just says, I am. I just am. I have no beginning. I have no end. I just am. That is a statement that only God can make. And so we fast forward to the New Testament in the book of John. Jesus makes different I am statements, which people would have known were in reference to that Old Testament uh, event. And so in making these statements, Jesus is saying, I am the God from the burning bush. That's me. This is a cool connection there. And so uh, week one of our series, we were in the Old Testament looking at the the story in Exodus, just kind of setting it up. Week two, we heard Jesus say, I am the bread of life or an endless supply of everything you'll ever need. I am sustenance, right? Last week, it was, I am the light of the world. Today... We are looking at the next I am statement of Jesus. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the gate. I am the gate. And so that's the title of the message today, of course. Turn your Bibles over to John chapter 10, verse 1 to 10. We're not going to read just yet, but I just want you to get them ready. So go ahead and do that. We're going to read in a few moments, John 10, verse 1 to 10. And before we read the text, I just I want to set up the context. It's important to understand what's going on Um, in in this uh, story here, okay? Even though there's a break between John chapter 9 and John chapter 10 in the book of John, uh, John chapter 10 is actually a continuation of John chapter 9, okay? So back when the Bible was first recorded, there were no chapters and verses to help kind of break things down. These were added after just to help organize things. And so it's, it's all taking place at the exact same time. And so we want to go back to the book of, or to chapter 9 of John, And just look at what's happening so we can understand. We're not going to read it, but I do want to explain. So in John chapter 9, Jesus has just healed a blind beggar, right? This is the story where he puts dirt on the guy's eyes and tells him to go wash it out. And his eyes open completely after being blind since birth. And so this happens. People get word of this situation. um, and, And people see him with his eyes open and... They're astonished. Some are kind of confused. And ultimately, what happens is this man is brought to the Pharisees or the the religious leaders of the day so that they can investigate 
what's going on, right? Jesus healed the man on a Sabbath, which according to Jewish law, you're not supposed to do. Um, And so the Pharisees are upset because they're all about rules and they want to look into what just happened. And so by the end of this situation, the Pharisees are throwing insults at this former blind man for now following Jesus. They're, of course, not convinced that Jesus is God. They think he's a sinner. They're like, there's there's no way that this Jesus guy is of God. He would know, right? You don't heal on the Sabbath. Like, he, he would get it. And so they're now trying to lead astray this man who was just healed. They're trying to convince him why Jesus is a fake. They want him bound by the law. They throw him out of the synagogue, and basically their hatred for Jesus increases, and they're on a mission to to kill him. The Pharisees are religious, all about rules. They've made their lives about religion. They refuse to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They've made it their mission to ensure that people live up to the rules of the day, and in so doing, lead people astray. And so just to sum it up for you, The Pharisees believe that they are the gatekeepers of God. That based on their rules, they get to determine who's in and who's out. Who's forgiven and and who's not. Who gets to do what and when, who receives salvation and who does not. And so Jesus finds finds out that this man is thrown out of the temple. And so he goes and talks to him. And so at this point, as we come to, to John chapter 10... Um, the Pharisees are present, this man is present, some other people are present, and Jesus is now basically kind of calling out the Pharisees and having this teaching moment with them, and he says what we now know as John chapter 10, verse 1 to 10. You got the context? We're all good? Okay. So it's in this context that he says this, verses 1 to 10 of John 10. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's good, eh? And so there's lots going on in this text that can be confusing. Um, In fact, the Pharisees themselves in the text, it says like they have no idea what he's talking about. Some of you might be feeling the same way. And so um, here's what's going on. I'm going to explain it. Jesus is using some very familiar terminology and word, word pictures for, for the people of the day, right? And so a lot of you know this, but uh, farming and livestock, uh, it was all very common back then, right? There's references in scripture all the time about harvesting and planting, right? It's all very common. And so culturally, this word picture here would have been very relatable. And so over and over again, Jesus describes his church, um, his followers as sheep, who follow him, the shepherd. And so that's the picture that you need to keep in mind. We are his sheep, and he is the shepherd. In fact, that's another I am statement of Jesus, which we're going to get to in a couple weeks. So there's a little bit of overlap because it's kind of all in the same chapter here, but we're going to try to stay focused on I am the gate so that I don't steal someone else's sermon, okay? <laughs> Although if I do, I mean, you can't fire me, right? <laughs> you can't. There's just, oh literally so much I could do up here because you can't fire me. It's amazing. (laughs) In in verses 1 to 5 of John 10, Jesus starts by describing a typical first century uh, sheep pen and the way that it functioned for sheep, for shepherds and sheep back in the day. And so I'm going to take you to school this morning. We're going to learn about ancient sheep and the keeping of those sheep. 
And so obviously sheep are led by a shepherd, all right? Sheep are really incapable of being independent. And so a shepherd cares for them, bonds with them, uh, leads them. Sheep actually learn to recognize the voice of their shepherd so much so that they won't follow a stranger if one calls them, as the, the text says. And sheep would be kept in pens for protection, right? They needed to be in enclosed areas, especially at night uh, or when the weather was bad so that they stayed safe because otherwise they'd be in trouble, right? You'd maybe follow another sheep and, and get lost, uh, get eaten by a wolf, get stolen, fall off a cliff and die. All of the things that happen if you're a sheep, okay? I've never been a sheep before, so I don't know what it's like. I have dressed up as a sheep once in my life. But again, that's a story you're never going to get to hear because this is my last Sunday <laughs> preaching. So praise God for that. Uh, sheep were kept in a pen, right? Which in this passage symbolizes safety, peace, pasture, and belonging, right? If a sheep is allowed in the pen, that means it belongs there with the other sheep. And so back in the day, there were two different kinds of sheep folds or pens that would have been common. And so uh, I'm going to teach you. We have a picture. The first one is what I'm just calling the public pen. There should be a picture that's coming up here. Yeah, beautiful. This is obviously a reenactment. It's not an actual picture from the Bible times, just in case you're wondering. Um, but that kind of gives you an idea of what we're working with here. And so you would find pens like that uh, in cities and villages, uh, in more populated areas. Sometimes they'd be even larger than that. Um, and if they were larger, you'd often find more than one flock of sheep um, in that pen for, for the night. And so they could graze, they could be at peace, and, and kind of do their thing, knowing that the gatekeeper would make sure that they didn't get out or let unwanted things uh, or people in, right? And these pens had a gate on them, okay? I was going to say much like this one, probably something like that. Uh, shout out to my dad and Pastor Mike Kanji for building that last minute, by the way. Um... And so the, these pens had a gate on them, right? There was a single entry point, and the gatekeeper would guard that gate at, at night and then let the appropriate shepherds in in the morning. And that's one of the reasons we read in John 10, verse 2, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. So that's the public pen. Then we've got another type of pen, which I'm calling the countryside pen, all right? And we have a picture of that as well. So you can go ahead and throw that up. It's a little blurry. This is a painting, but that kind of gives you an idea. That's the countryside pen. And so those were in more secluded areas out in open lands. And sheep would often be placed in these pens when the weather was nice. Um, and again, that's very different than uh, the sheep pens you might see today, right? Like if you're driving along the 401 basically from anywhere, anywhere from here to London, right? The pens are a little bit nicer. Which, by the way, <laughs> I was thinking about this the other day. That drive from Windsor to London has to be the most boring drive in all of Canada, okay? I was just thinking that, and I'm like, oh, I have to get that off my chest. <laughs> and so these, these biblical pens, like the one you just saw, were basically like a bunch of rocks built up um, in a circle or a rectangle or some other shape, built up to make walls. And then these sheep pens, there was just, a, just an opening, so no gate, just a single opening. And so, like in the picture, the gatekeeper would keep the sheep in the pen and keep wild animals and wolves, thieves, things of that nature out by lying across the opening. So the gatekeeper would essentially become the gate for the sheep. Okay? So the scripture is starting to, to make sense now, isn't it? Right? This picture brings to life Jesus' statement. And let's read it again, verses 7 to 10. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So Jesus uses this incredible imagery that would have made so much sense to the people of the day. The picture, Parkwood, in essence, is this. Uh, the sheep pen represents this idea of being uh, set apart as followers of, of Jesus. This, the pen is where the true followers of God are, right? It represents heaven, eternity with the Father, access to God, salvation, 
The sheep are people who have true relationship with God. And so Jesus, in this text, is saying to the Pharisees, he's saying this, in the same way that the thieves and robbers, um, you know, back in the day, would climb into the sheep pen and get in by some means other than the gates to, to steal the sheep, to lead them astray, right? He's like, Pharisees, you know that that's not how it's supposed to work. There's a gate, like, you know. He's saying, you Pharisees who are insulting this healed man, you're trying to make his healing and my healing work about rules. You're trying to nullify it. You're trying to make it about the Sabbath, right? Telling him that, that I'm not the Messiah because I haven't done things according to how you think someone from God is supposed to do things. He's saying you're thieves and you're robbers. You're robbing people of truth. It's this idea, which is true for us today, that just as a thief climbs over the wall of the sheep pen bypassing the gates, False teachers attempt to bypass Jesus and claim you can get to God some other way. Right? And so those who, like the Pharisees, put, put man-made requirements on, on people for salvation, right, are false teachers who steal people's ability to see the true means of salvation. And so Jesus says, right, that the true sheep, my people, don't listen to those thieves. Jesus is saying this, the only way that someone can have a true relationship with God, can enter the sheep pen, can find pasture and peace and safety and receive true salvation, forgiveness from sin. Uh, eternity with the Father is by entering the pen through the gate. And then he says, I am the gate. The only way that you get to God is through me. And he, that's not, he's not saying it like, you know, you want to get to God, you got to get through me first. No. It's an invitation. He's saying, I'm the single entry point to the Father. He's hitting home what he says a few chapters later, a bit more plainly in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's another I am statement we're getting to. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so when I was younger, um, you know, I'd, I'd hang, out, hang out with friends, and, you know, we'd roam around town. I grew up in LaSalle. Anybody from LaSalle? Where are my LaSalle people at? Woo! Wow, not many of you. Okay. It's okay. I live in Windsor now. Windsor? Yeah? Great. Oh, man. Um, we were kids, right? We'd do what kids do, and, and we'd ride our bikes, and we'd go, you know, explore and, and whatever. On weekends, PA days, all that good stuff, and... We'd go hang out at the park and sometimes in LaSalle and other parks in, in Windsor. And, you know, you go to, to certain parks. Um, you've got, you know, jungle gym. You've got uh, trails, basketball courts, all of that kind of stuff. And then some parks you go to, there's tennis courts, right, that have, have fences around them. And then there's, there's a gate, right? Uh, and so I remember one time we went to, I went to the park with some friends and... Uh, we wanted to, I don't, I don't even think we wanted to play tennis. We just wanted to go in and, and have fun and, and cause trouble probably. And so um, we, we wanted to get into this tennis court, but the, but the gate was locked. It was after hours. And so um, we do what any respectful uh, young citizens of the city do. We, we try to climb the fence, um, right? We want, we want to get in and have fun. Anyone else ever hopped the fence, be hopped the fence before? Let's be honest. You know who you are. Right? Bunch of fence hoppers. It's kind of exhilarating, right? It's, 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 kind, of, it's kind of exhilarating. But here's the thing. Um, here's the thing that I experienced as I was, I was doing, doing this, climbing the fence. Maybe you can relate. I don't know what my friends were feeling or thinking, but as I'm climbing the fence, there's this sense of, like, fear, right, that someone might see us, of course, and also, like, a little bit of guilt. Like, you just, you just know you're not supposed to be doing it, right? Ultimately, you know that whoever put um, that fence there did it for a reason. And then what they did is they left an opening and put a gate there to send, send this message. That, yes, you're welcome in this space. Okay? You're absolutely welcome, but you have to use the designated entry point. That's, that's the message, right? You know, then they can make sure that whoever's supposed to be in there is... is is, is allowed in there, right, in that fenced area. Sure, you can come in, but you have to use the gate. And so by us hopping the fence, we were in the wrong, right? Maybe not thieves and robbers, but definitely trespassers. And so God kind of has, has a similar message for people. Back then, 
and back today, or, and today he's saying, like, yes, I want you to dwell with me. I absolutely want that. I love you. You are welcome. Come to me. Have access to me. Find pasture and peace and healing and safety and spend eternity with me. I love you. You are allowed, but you have to enter through the gate. There's no other option. Jesus is the only way to God. And so you, you might ask, right, like maybe, maybe you're, you're not familiar. You, you might ask, well, why? Like, first of all, why is there a gate at all? And okay, even if there has to be a gate, great. Why is Jesus the gate? Like, like help, help me understand. Here's the truth. God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. He created humans. He created us perfect, perfect creatures can dwell in the presence of a perfect God. Evil and imperfection cannot. And when God created us, he said we were good. We hadn't sinned. This idea of pasture and peaceful grazing in the presence of God, we had that and it was glorious, right? But then sin entered the world. And Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, humanity messed up, and our relationship with God was fractured. Evil and imperfection cannot dwell with a perfect God, and we are evil and imperfect. Apart from God, we are dead in our sin. Hopeless, lost, eternity apart from God is the end consequence. In the eyes of a just God, there has to be consequences for sin. Someone has to pay the price. Enter Jesus, God in the flesh. Jesus came to earth to dwell among us, lived a perfect life, sinless, spotless, and out of his love paid the price for our sin. He said, I'm going to pay the penalty for them, Father. And he went to the cross to die the death that we should have died. Three days later, he rose from the dead. He is alive today. Because of his sacrifice, we can be restored to right relationship with God again we do that by coming to Jesus, the one who paid the price, right? It's by coming to Jesus, by recognizing our need for a savior and allowing his perfection to be applied to our imperfection. That is how and that is why we enter the sheep pen through Jesus. Verses 9 to 10 of John 10, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Yeah. Apart from Jesus, yeah, you can clap for that. That's good news for sure. <laughs> Apart from Jesus, you are not capable of being freed from the chains of your sin and death. There is no other way to God except through Jesus and his perfect, sufficient work on the cross. Climbing the wall won't work. Trying to get to God your own way by your own rules, right? Your own idea of the truth. This is the message Jesus is sending to the Pharisees and to us. Your own idea of religion, maybe mixing in, you know, a few different religions. And it's Jesus and then Buddha, a little bit of this, a little bit of, little bit of that. Right, My good works, trying to be perfect on your own so that you might measure up. All of it is a futile attempt, like the Pharisees, to try to get into the sheep pen some other way and to encourage others to do the same. Only thieves and robbers refuse to use the gate. Amy, if you can come. We still have a couple minutes left in the, in the message here, but I would love for Amy to come. She's just going to play some keys. <clears throat> Please hear me. Jesus is the only way to God. Jesus is the only way to God. This is the message that Jesus sent to the Pharisees. And so as we close shortly in just a little bit from now, the application for today is kind of twofold. Okay, there's, there's a twofold application and then a third thing, which is just going to be an invitation that I want to walk us through at the end. Okay, so Jesus makes this statement that I, I am the gate. In fact, this is the posture of the gate, which is amazing. We'll come back to that in just a moment. 
He makes this statement, I am the gate. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, well, so what? Like, what does that mean for us today? Right? What do we do? Or how do we, how do we apply this truth to our lives? Like, what's the, what's the call to action here? And so let's talk for a few minutes. The first thing is, is this, and you can write this down if you're taking notes. Uh, we need to watch out for thieves and robbers. It's point number one. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but it is an, an important reminder. For the Christian in the room today, even though you're saved and have a relationship with God, thieves and robbers still exist, right? There are people who come along all the time and, and claim to hear that they've heard from God when really they haven't because what they've heard doesn't line up with Scripture at all, right? There, there are other religions that believe in Jesus but then have other things added and mixed in, right? People come along all the time to claim that Jesus isn't the only way, or claims of here's why the Bible isn't, or it's outdated, or, or you know, Jesus didn't really mean that when, when he said, he said this, right? And sometimes it's subtle, right? The devil loves to subtly twist, twist the truth. All of this and more still occurs in the world today. And so the call really is this, we just, we need to watch out, right? We, we just need to be on our guard. My sheep know my voice, right? And so we need to know the voice of God and follow only that voice. We do that part by primar primarily by knowing his word. And so that's a great practical call to action, action today, right? Go home and, and get in your word. Know the word. Study the scriptures. Know what it says. Be rooted in the truth of scripture. And check everything you hear by the Bible, including everything that I'm saying right now. Right? We look to the word of of God. So he's spoken his truth, right? And so the call out of John 10 is just, we just, just be on your guard. We need to watch out for thieves and robbers, know the truth of scripture. And then the second uh, application would, would be this, and it's very, very important as well. We need to lead people to the gate. We need to lead people to the gate. We have to show people where the gate is. Because here's the thing, right? There's people in our lives who, who know that Jesus is the gate, but maybe just have no desire to, to enter through him, right? Or, or there's people that maybe knowingly um, live their own way and try to get to God through their, through their own good works and play gatekeeper. They want to climb the wall and make it difficult. They want to rob people of truth. Or for some reason, they know what the truth is, but they just don't feel the need to come to Jesus and absolutely, like we need to continue to reach those people and pray for them and encourage them and love them and speak truth over their lives. And so we, we have people like that in our lives. But then there are also people in our lives at your workplaces, at your schools, families, like, like you name it, people who don't even know there's a gate open for them to walk through. They don't even know. And so if you take that, that picture of the, the sheep pen again, the one with the rocks, if, if you picture that, okay, like, like maybe you have people in your lives who are, who are on the backside of the pen, right? They can't even see the gate. And so they look and they're like, well, there's no opening, so why would I even bother? Or I'm going to get in here and I'm going I'm to climb the wall, right? I'm going to try to climb the wall and, and it's, you know, it's good works and I can do this. Here's why I deserve to be in heaven. I'm a good person. And they're climbing and trying to get in and it just isn't going to work. But they have no idea that there's a gate just on the other side of that wall. We need to lead them to the gate. We need to tell people in our lives two things. Number one, not only can you not get into in any other way, best news ever, you don't have to. You don't have to. That's the message of the gospel. Right? And so even if you're here listening to me right now and you're that person, you don't have to climb the wall. There's a gate. <laughs> and his name is Jesus. It's such good news. The gate's open and he wants you to come to him. Why would you want to climb the wall? It's exhausting. It's work. It's tiring. The whole point of the gospel is that we don't have to work to find pasture. To receive salvation, Jesus did the work. People need to know that and be led to 
the gate. And as the Bible says, how will they know if we don't tell them? That's our mission as followers of Jesus. You leave here this morning and you go out and we lead people to the gate. And so lastly, um, naturally, it's only fitting that I, I just make that invitation. So if you're not a follower of Jesus in the room, online, maybe you're watching this later, whatever, you've, you've heard the gospel of Jesus so clearly in this text. Okay, you've heard that there is only one way to God. And you've heard that the gate is open. I want to I invite you to walk through the gate today. That's it. I want to invite you to walk through the gates. And again, you've heard this, but as humans, we're sinners. We're broken, messed up. Jesus looked at all of it and said, I still love you. I'm going to die for your sin. I will do the work so that you don't have to. That is a message of freedom today. You don't have to climb the wall. You just need to recognize that Jesus is the Savior you need today. And so if you look at this gate right here, think, think of it this way. Um, on, on this side of the gate, so before you, you enter, right, this side of the gate, there's a broken and, and sinful, messed up person, right? And we get to come to Jesus with all of our, of our brokenness and our sin. You don't have to clean yourself up before you come to Christ, right? We stand here in our brokenness, recognizing that Jesus is the Savior that we need, right? We give our lives to Jesus. His sacrifice was enough. And then what happens is we, we pass through the gates, right? And now we're standing on this side of the gate having just passed through perfection, right? This, this here represents like a, like a change. You were one way, you've now just passed through the, the perfect life and perfect work of Jesus on the cross. So now when you're on this side of the gate, you're a, you're a different person, Amen. right? God now looks at you and sees the perfect life of Jesus applied to your life. When he looks at you, he sees perfection because of who you've passed through. That's the picture. And so Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, just to kind of bring it home, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So all you, literally, all you need to do is receive salvation today. It is a free gift that Jesus offers. And it means that when you die, you can be assured that you will dwell in the presence of your creator forever. Eternity with Jesus Eternal pasture. I love that word. And so if you're ready to take the step today, all that I'm going to do in this moment before we close is I'm just going to lead us in a, in a prayer. And all that I want you to do is repeat after me and just meet it in your heart. God seriously makes it that simple. You believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and you will be saved. You don't have to work to earn salvation. God is saying, come to me. In your brokenness, come to me. I love you. Receive me. And so I just want you, in fact, we're all going to pray it together because I realize being centered out can be a little bit uncomfortable. And so we're just going to pray it together. You're going to repeat after me. Uh, and, then, and then we're going to go from there. Sound good? Awesome. Let's pray. So God, I know that I am a sinner. And there is nothing that I can do to save myself. Today, I confess my complete helplessness to forgive my own sin or to work my way to heaven. I trust Christ alone as the one who bore my sin when he died on the cross. I believe that he did all that will ever be necessary for me to stand in your holy presence. I thank you that Christ was raised from the dead 
as a guarantee of my own resurrection. Today, I'm walking through the gate. Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. I trust you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. So practically, here's all that I want to do. If you prayed that prayer today for the very first time, whether you're online, um, in, in, in the building, I just I want you to pull out your phone. We're going to make it nice and, and easy for you. Pull out your phone, and you're just going to text the word. It's a keyword, the word salvation to the number on the screen. It's going to be up. Yeah, I was going to say, if it wasn't, it'd be really awkward. Um, just text the word salvation to the number on the screen. If you don't have a phone, grab a Connect card from the seat in front of you. Pull it out. Uh, throw your name on it. There should be a box there for you to check. I have decided to follow Jesus. Something like that. Uh, bring it to the info desk or drop it in one of the donation boxes. That would be awesome. Whether you text or you, you fill out that physical card, uh, you're going to get a, a automatic response if you text. And then someone's just going to be in touch with you next week, um, an actual person, just to kind of celebrate with you, um, walk with you, and uh, just talk about your next steps as a follower of, of Jesus. Praise God that he is the gate and it's open. Amen. 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 So I would love, just as we close, I just want to pray. I uh, want to pray and uh, pray over, over you guys as well. So would you please join me as I do that? God, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you for the truth of your scripture. I thank you, God, that you, <laughs> Jesus, that you are the gate and that you welcome us with open arms to come to you, God, in our brokenness. Lord, I thank you that you went to the cross out of your love for us. I thank you that was enough. God, the invitation to walk through the gate is one that we don't deserve, yet you invite us anyway. I thank you so much for that, God. If there was somebody here today who walked through the gate today for the very first time, Lord, I pray blessing. Regardless, God, you're working in hearts and the truth of your scripture goes forth in power, God. God, I want to pray blessing over Parkwood. For every single person, every single family who calls Parkwood home, God, I pray blessing over them, Lord. Pray blessing over our, our youth, God. In this next season, Lord, I pray blessing over Pastor Danny and the team as they continue to lead this church. It's so exciting, God, what you're doing here in this city, in this church, God. Everything that's going to take place with the new campus downtown, God, you're in it. And we're so excited for what it's all going to look like, God. Every single part of it is for your glory, Lord. So, God, I pray blessing over Parkwood Gospel Church, Lord. I thank you for the privilege and the opportunity that I've had to serve as a pastor here, God. Every single aspect, Lord, it's all for your glory, Jesus. Would you receive the glory, the honor, and the praise? In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 Praise God. Pastor Danny.